What's up guys and gals? Today we have an awesome podcast for you where we're going to be talking about the most famous shot in all of pickleball right now. Definitely the most popular. And me and Spencer actually haven't talked about what we think that the most famous shot is. And so Spencer, I'm going to ask you what you think the most famous shot is and then we'll see if we have the same exact one. I don't know if famous is the right word, but popular. Yeah, the new the new most popular shot. So I think... I mean, we could be talking about two different shots here, yeah, but could. I would guess, I would guess that we're both thinking about the same one, and this is the two-handed backhand dink with topspin. <laughs> okay, that was way more specific. I was just thinking the two-handed backhand in general, but yeah, two-handed backhand dink definitely. All right, so the James uh, Ignatowicz. Yeah. let's talk about both those things. Let's talk about the two-handed backhand in general first. That's obviously cool. very popular right now, and and for good reason. I've had my ups and downs with it. Sometimes I hate it, and I give up on it, and then other times I'm back at it. I think for some people it comes more naturally. Uh, you have a really good one, so talk to us about the two-handed backhand in general. Two-handed backhand volley, I'd say I have a really good one. Two-handed backhand drive, I need more power on it. Two-handed backhand dink, I loft it up a ton, and it needs a ton of practice. But I would say my, in, or, in, it, in order to instruct you guys on any two-handed backhand, I would say I'm more, I have way more expertise definitely in that two-handed backhand topspin volley because mm -hmm. that just comes way more naturally to me than a dink. With the dink, it's just really difficult to keep that ball low and soft. Mm -hmm. And just comes down to getting reps in, which I just haven't done. Just got to get a ton of reps in, and then you'll figure it out. But it, it's it's an interesting shot, and something that you hear all the time, and something that I wanted to talk about specifically in this podcast is a lot of people will say it's just a non-dominant handed forehand, which has a lot of truth to it. But that's just it's that's a partial truth because okay. you actually want to utilize that dominant arm as well as you're coming through the shot. By so doing, you'll have a lot more accuracy, power, spin, control by using that dominant arm as well and not just having it just on for the ride, which you hear so often. I'm sure if you've taken lessons about a two-handed backhand, you'll hear just put your dominant arm, leave it on there for the ride and just let the non-dominant arm take over. Right. Um, but it's, yeah, like I said, it's a partial, partial truth. What have you heard, Spencer? Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, would you still suggest, and the way that I started out practicing the two-handed backhand is actually, okay, so I'm I'm right-handed. And the best thing that's helped me is by putting my left hand on the paddle yeah. and just hitting left-hand drives only or left-hand dinks only, and then gradually putting my right hand on there. And yes, I have heard just bring it along for the ride, but try to let your left hand do the motion. But my brain doesn't compute still a lot. Um, so I think I incidentally use my dominant hand a little bit more than I should. But explain to us why that could be a good thing. And would you still suggest starting with just your non-dominant hand only and getting used to that feel? Definitely. If you look at any of the top pros, they can very e that have two-handed backhands they can very easily hit with their non-dominant arm and it honestly looks natural and they yeah. they're really consistent with it colin johns he in tennis actually had a a two two-sided forehand i guess you could say so he would hit lefty forehands and righty forehands he didn't have a backhand and ben is ambidextrous so he for those of you that don't know he can play and he could probably medal in a 5-0 tournament playing left-handed like that's how good he is at playing with that non-dominant arm so i think that's essential wow. especially for the muscle development but as for getting that added control it's not just it's on for the ride if you want added control that's why you're using two hands you're not just using a lefty for or sorry not lefty but a non-dominant forehand for those of you that yeah. are lefty out there I'm pretty sure everybody knows, and I'm sure lefties are so used to everybody just saying, you know, oh, just use your left hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But they're probably numb to it by now. Yeah. Yeah. In my P 
PTR certification, professional tennis registry. That was one of the biggest things that they talked about is you say non-dominant. You don't say, you know, lefty or ready. Anyways, that's a different story. What I am suggesting is that you have to use both and you actually want to use your dominant arm as a, you're, you're hitting your normal backhand, but you want to really push outward towards your target with your non-dominant as your dominant okay. is coming upward as your non-dominant is coming upward. So one more time so that that makes sense. Since I said it backwards, your dominant is going to be pushing outward as your non-dominant is pushing upward, creating that top spin. You want to have actually a firmer grip pressure with your dominant than your non-dominant. Your non-dominant is going to have a light grip pressure, but be doing majority of the motion while your dominant is going to have a firmer grip pressure. Now, this isn't, I'm not suggesting that everybody does this in the pros. And this is just what I have found works best for me. And the reason that I, that how I figured this out was actually Andre Agassi. For those of you that don't know who Andre Agassi is, I feel like majority of people should since he plays pickleball now. But he has yeah. one of the best backhands in all of tennis, one of the best backhand returns in all of tennis. And he talks about how he uses a majority of his dominant arm. So I'm not suggesting that you use majority by any means. You should use majority of your non-dominant. But what when he explains it, he talks about how he is coming outward through that shot. And that's where all of his power is coming from, is from his dominant arm pushing outward as his non-dominant pushes upward. So kind of interesting. But have you ever heard it explained that way before, Spencer? No, but now I'm going to try that. So let's clarify. Uh, I, I know that you've clarified, but you did say upward twice, one of the times. So I just want to clarify. Yeah. So if I'm going to go out and practice this right now, my non-dominant hand should be upward or outward? Non-dominant hand is going upward. Okay. So I'm right-handed. In other words, my left hand, my non-dominant hand would be moving somewhat upward while my right hand or my dominant hand is more forward, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm excited to try that. Because I thought for a minute, I thought for a minute there, you, you were going to say when you were talking about left-handers and right-handers, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, and everybody knows that right-handers are better than left-handers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would definitely have been the majority. Said that. <laughs> I wish I was lefty uh, though, but yeah, yeah I have think an advantage. The main thing is with using that dominant arm as well, and not just having it on merely for the ride, but actually utilizing it, is that you're going to get away from being choked up and choked in. Because if it's just on for the ride, then non-dominant's going outward and upward, and dominant elbow is just staying in by your side. And if you w go watch any pros. That's not happening. Both arms are coming out together. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they're both coming out is because that dominant arm is pushing outwards. And naturally, the non-dominant is going to do the same. But all that you have to focus on is dominance outwards, non-dominant is upwards. And that's going to create that top spin. while at the same time, you're not going to be super close into your body. It's going to be away from your body, allowing you to be able to get rotation on the ball, rotation through your hips without being mm -hmm. choked in and losing out on power and spin as well so definitely yeah. so that's the that's the two-handed volley now i would say the same could work for the two-handed top spin dink but i just have not had enough reps to instruct on it um but i feel like spencer has been practicing that a lot because i've seen a lot of uh instagram posts tell us about that <laughs> I've definitely filmed it a lot. I don't know if I've been practicing it a lot. It looks good. But I feel film. somewhat I feel somewhat comfortable doing it. My my biggest tip that I could give, well, before before I do that, it makes sense to me what you're saying. We're just going to talk in circles here, but I just do want to repeat one more time what you said about your dominant hand just being on for the ride. If it's just on for the ride, why is it there at all? Yeah. So it's it's got to be doing something. So what you said makes sense. I'm going to I'm going to try it again with that uh outlook and see see if that helps a little bit. One quick thing. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. There's this 
guy named Mason Ford. He's a good friend of mine. And he's like the OG of pickleball, the original <laughs> pickleball number one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not number one, but he was winning tournaments against um, Tyler Loom eight years ago and uh, Chuck Taylor, players like that, winning tournaments with him and his friend, Eric Gubler. And when I talked to Mason about this, he was asking me about my two-handed backhand, and he has probably the best two-handed backhand of of anybody two-handed backhand volley-wise. Uh-huh. Um, anybody that's not in the pros, so just really high level. And he, I was talking to him, and he was asking me about non-dominant compared to dominant. He said he uses majority dominant, which I thought was really interesting. I don't suggest doing that necessarily. Because it works for him, might not work for you. But I would suggest utilizing more of your dominant arm as you hit through your backhand. I think that you'll like it a lot more, especially for those two-handed backhand haters out there that just can't seem to figure it out. Like me. Yeah, like Spencer. (laughs) (laughs) I think that'll really help. Anyways, let's move on. Dink. Okay. So on the two-handed backhand topspin dink, it's really creating havoc for your opponent. Because it's putting a lot of pressure on them and typically causing a pop up or a miss hit. Um, sometimes you can take it too far and then they get an ATP on their end. So you should really dial it in. But this shot is so popular that the number one player in the world recently decided to add it to his repertoire. So the fact that Ben Johns is already the best decided to add it to his game tells me that it's an important shot and maybe we should start working on it and then for me the number one thing that's helped me with this shot in particular is is i hope i'm not this works for me just like you said the other works for you this is what works for me is shortening my swing path when i do it if I have too big of a swing path, one, it's, I'm prone to injury, as you may have seen in one of our previous <laughs> videos when I hit myself in the eyebrow, Fact. or uh, it's just unnecessary. That much, um, that big of a swing path is more prone to errors in my personal experience. But what is your swing path, Oz, when you're doing a two-handed uh, backhand topspin dink. Hey, just really quick. Spencer almost bled out, by the way, okay? He almost <laughs> died on the court from a two-handed backhand dink. <laughs> it was dripping. It was dripping. Straight dripping. Yeah. That was that the carbon fiber. Video. That carbon fiber gearbox paddle got me, man. It'll get you. You, you got to look that There's video a... up, guys. That that paddle is dangerous. <laughs> um, Maybe I'll re- repost it soon. Yeah, that's Yeah, you have to repost it then. Since we're talking about this, but what what what, what was your question? What was your <laughs> your your swing path? Where do you typically start and where do you typically finish? Yeah, I'm with you 100. percent It's really short, so I'm actually starting. I would say in between my legs, and then I'm hitting it, try, trying to make contact somewhere in between my legs and my front knee, which is going to be for everybody, I guess, their dominant knee. Somewhere in between there is where you're making contact. And then that motion is outward and upward with just a ton of upward torque. Like I've yeah. said, like I said, if I can get it right and get my timing right and everything like that, it's pretty wicked. And it's pretty difficult for the opponents because like Spencer's saying, it's it's putting that extra pressure by putting top spin and it's kicking. And so they're just in a constant scramble to get the ball back. And if they're hitting underspin on that as it's coming with topspin, since it's heading in that topspin direction, they hit underspin, they're putting the same exact spin that already came on the ball, which is probably going to cause them to pop the ball up. Just take my word for it. You don't really have to think too much about the actual spin of it, but that will automatically cause the ball to be popped upwards because the spin's traveling in the same direction. The only way to really counter it is to hit top spin back, which next to nobody can do right now. But it's becoming a lot more popular, so you kind of need to figure it out and, and get caught up with it. But 
yeah, my swing path is really small. I'm just simply, I'm starting there right in between my legs, making contact in between my dominant leg and, and the middle of my body. And then I'm coming up to about shoulder height, just below my face area. The more condensed you can keep it, the more consistent it's going to be. Yeah, and I would also suggest, this will be my last suggestion with this shot. I do have some experience with it. I feel like I am more consistent with it now. But my last suggestion would be to try to, at least in the beginning, at least uh, for a while, try to keep, if you're watching this on YouTube, the tips of my fingers are my paddle head and I'm pointing them directly at the camera. Try to keep your paddle head somewhat in the same position during your swing path instead of bringing your paddle head. I've just had a lot of mishits this way from a downward position all the way to an upward position as you're hitting that shot. Definitely. Because I, th I think that's just causing more errors. Uh, there's more of a chance that you're going to have an error because of more movement of the paddle. Whereas if you just have try to keep your, um, let's say, try to keep the head of your paddle pointed somewhat towards the net during your entire upward and forward motion, uh, I think you can more consistently hit that shot without as many errors. Unless you're Connor Garnett, I totally agree. Because yeah. <laughs> Connor Garnett's definitely going tip down to tip up, and he's doing a full motion. Like, there's no condensed in it. It's just yeah. his timing's impeccable, and he just has – a natural backhand, which people don't have, it just doesn't happen. If you have a natural backhand, all, you can definitely try it. But if you think he's about to do what he wants, yeah, yeah. If you think about James Ignatovich backhand dink, it's very small, and yes, that tip is staying facing forward throughout the entire motion. There might be a little bit of down and up, but it's not like a major, like you're hitting a ground stroke, because that's going right. to add on way too much. I totally agree. Well, I guess our final suggestion would be to try this out if you aren't already. And if you are, the best thing you can do is to drill it over and over. Don't just go start playing rec games and trying it. I mean, that will give you some help, but it'll also make you a little bit look a little bit stupid when yeah. you're, <laughs> you know, shanking them and popping them up. I've the biggest issue of people that have asked us questions on social media has has been I'm having trouble because I keep popping this up. And I think time on court, specifically drilling time on court, can help uh, solve that problem. 100%. Got to get out and drill. That's where a ball machine comes in handy, too. It's having a ball machine yeah. that can hit you a consistent ball over and over and over again so that you can just focus on the motion. Whereas when you're playing against someone, they're not going to give you a consistent ball, which can be good, but it can also hinder because... Maybe they speed up one and now you're having to hit a back end. But if you can just get those reps in over and over and over again, a ball machine, a wall can be good too, but a ball machine can put that spin on it, which, which sets it apart. Good point. Very good point. So to recap today, I would say something I'm going to try, something that Austin just taught all of us is try to use your dominant hand a little bit more when you're hitting, um, any type of backhand, whether it's a volley or a drive, maybe use your dominant hand a little bit more for control. And then the other suggestion would be to shorten your swing path and focus uh, on drilling when you're, you know, try to get those reps in when you're hitting the backhand topspin dink. 100%. I'm excited to get some reps in now. Yeah, let's go do it right now. What is it, midnight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 10 o'clock here, 9 o'clock where you're at. I could be there around 11 o'clock your time. Yeah, it feels you know, if you came if you drove down here, you know I'd be game. Yeah. Anyone's down for pickleball. We go play in the dark. Let's go. <laughs> I'm down. Freaking Vegas dude has no indoor courts anywhere. Right? Uh, they do they do have they do have a few now, but one the one facility has three courts, and then the other facility is We're Chicken waste. and Pickle, which I believe they have some indoor courts, but I haven't been there. It's in Henderson. Three courts? Yep. What are they doing with three courts? I don't know. 
There's just Seven. a need for pickle right now, especially indoor pickle. It's a good there game a to need. be in. Yeah, dude. You yeah. should start one down there. Anything else, Haas? Nope. That's it. Thanks for joining us, guys. I hope that that was helpful and instructional. And we'll see you on the next one. Later.